Today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, precedence. We kind of maybe in some classes started talking about precedence the other day. A precedent is a, for, a first, like the first time something happens, the first time it's done. So the example, if we went over this in class the other day, the example of a precedent for us might be the first time you walk into class, the first day of the year, first day of the school year, and you walk in and I open the door and I say, Good morning, doorknobs. That's how we start every day. That's a precedent that was set on the first day of school. Or maybe the precedent that was set the first day you came to preschool or kindergarten, one of the things that you do early in the morning, whether it's right away or during when, is we stand up and we say the Pledge of Allegiance. That's a precedent that was set a long time ago, so you expect that in school that's a thing that happens. And it is, and I think think even in the high school it always will be. So we'll take a look at those precedents and some of the challenges that are facing our new government. Uh, some of the things that George Washington is immediately going to have to overcome. There are some people, remember the anti-federalists, that don't really love the idea of this new constitution maybe ordering us around or giving us direction. So we got issues with that. And then I will try to finish up so that you can have at least the skinny to work on your Bill of Rights project. Just as a reminder, that project is due for you Monday, or if you're Purple Kids watching this video on Friday, yours is due Tuesday. So no words on it. And remember, if you turn in a piece of garbage project, you're gonna get a piece of garbage grade, and this is a summative assessment. So, <coughs> excuse me, you're gonna wanna uh, get a, a good score on by the looks of yesterday's, when people have to come and ask me, How, is this good enough, Mr. Bellamy? You've already answered your question. If you have to ask me, that means it's not. It means you're checking to see if I'll give you a score for something that you know you didn't really put your full effort into. And also, make sure you understand what your amendment is before you try drawing it. I had two yesterday that were shown to me, and they didn't even know what their amendment was. I said, what are you trying to show me? I don't really know. So you just drew a picture or something? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. So make sure you focus on that. Uh, but a skinny work time today to, to get that done. What's not done today, uh, send home with the person who's done the least or who's the most likely to get it done. Or you divide up the work. I don't know how you're going to do it. But what doesn't get done during class today becomes homework for you. So. Make sure it gets done and ready to turn in on Monday. And we should have a Medal of Honor Monday person or Medal of Honor, uh, yeah, Monday person for you guys. So we'll be ready tomorrow. All right. So going back to precedence. A precedent is a first, the, the first time somebody's done something. So when we have this new government, everything that's done is a precedent. Every new day is a precedent that's set by the government or in this instance, we're going to talk about George Washington setting precedents. So every time George Washington decides how the daily life of a president looks, that is a precedent. Presidents? Precedents. So the precedent might have been set for you, what a regular day of school looks like when you were four going to preschool. You wake up, you eat a bowl of cereal, mom takes you to school, you go to school, you come home, you have a snack, you watch Phineas and Ferb, you do a little homework, you eat dinner, you watch TV, you go to bed. That could very well be the regular day in the life of a normal person. And then when you get to middle school, things change a little bit because you've got middle school sports. And then when you get to high school, things change a little bit because you've got sports and lots of other activities. For those of you that aren't involved in sports, the high school is an awesome place for clubs and activities. And there's always something for you to be involved with get involved with. So it, those are precedents that are set, and precedents can be changed. But one of those is Mr. President. So the, the idea was, what are we going to call the executive branch, the, the chief executive? And some people kind of thought we should have fancy names, you know, His Majesty, but that's too kingy. Or His Highness, that's too kingy or, his, or too judgy. So Mr. President precedent is set. That's George Washington's idea. It, it, mister, that's just like a regular ordinary guy. Every man is a mister that's out there. And 
president. That's just his title. So it's ordinary and simple. So George Washington's idea was that the president of the United States isn't necessarily elevated to a level above a normal, average, ordinary person, even though we know that's not truly the case. But that precedent has stuck with all 43 of these men that are up here on the wall. They are all Mr. President. So if uh, uh, Pr President Biden comes walking into the classroom this morning, the appropriate way for us to address him, whether you like him or not, is good morning, Mr. President. If uh, President Trump walks into the classroom, the appropriate way to address him, whether you love him or hate him, is good morning, Mr. President. President. So even after you're done being president, you're still Mr. President. So what happens if Barack Obama walks in? Mr. President. Mr. President. How about George Bush? Mr. President. Mr. President. How about uh, Bill Clinton? Mr. President. Mr. President. How about George Bush? <laughs> well, if George Bush comes walking in, it's probably that he's a zombie. Because he's dead. So we're not going to call him Mr. President because... If he comes walking in here, there's just lots of screaming and hollering. And I'm not sure how do you kill a zombie. Uh, you don't. Axe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, axe would work. <coughs> Does an axe kill a zombie? You have to chop off their head, or how do you yeah. chop off his head? I don't know. You just throw Ethan at him. Yeah. Or we could just run it, like, yeah. Zombies eat like, humans, yeah, right? So. We just throw oh, yeah. Ethan at him, and then that keeps him busy gnawing on Ethan, and we can sneak out the other door, and we're all safe. We just sacrifice Ethan to the zombies. It's just the way it is. So, Mr. President, that's plain and simple and ordinary and appropriate, because we're not supposed to elevate our politicians to a level where they're above us. They're not supposed to be valued any greater than an ordinary citizen. I'm not sure we're very good about that, but that's the case. Then... Uh, George Washington sitting around in his office, and he's thinking, you know, one of the problems that I've got is I don't know everything about everything. Nobody does. <clears throat> so he decides to create what's called a cabinet. Now, it's not like the cabinet in the back of the room where we store our guns. <clears throat> For the substitute that's watching this, we do not actually have a place where we store our guns. Or it's not like the cabinet in the kitchen that you open up where you keep the Cheerios. This is just a, a group of advisors to the president. So George Washington had four cabinet members, and most of the time cabinet members are called secretaries. So when you're watching the evening news and they're talking about the secretary of the interior, that doesn't mean the same thing as what we usually think of when we think of a secretary. When I think of a secretary, I think of the two ladies in the front office that you check in with when you get to school late, uh, or that call down here when uh, you have to leave school early, or that answer phones when your mom calls you in sick. That's what I think of when I think of secretary. And those are super important positions, and someday when you get a real job, you'll figure out that the two most important positions at your job, like I'm a teacher, the two most important positions in this building to me are the secretaries and the custodians because they're the ones that I go to if I actually need anything. Yes, Mr. Schwartz is my boss and he's super important. But if I need, uh, oh geez, we're out of pens. I need some pens. I got to be able to write stuff. It's not Mr. Schwartz that I go to asking for pens. It's one of the ladies in the front office because they know where all that stuff is. Or if someone yaks on my carpet and there's vomit all over the place, it's not Mr. Schwartz that I go to to clean up the vomit. It's the custodian. So those people become really important. Uh, or if you eat uh, school lunch and you want a larger portion, it's not the teachers that are your friends. The most important people to you are those lunch ladies. And you figure out really quickly that if you're nice to them and you say, hey, good afternoon, how are you today, that maybe they treat you a little bit better. They're not always grouchy old ladies. They're just normal people doing a job. And it's a thankless job because most of the time we just stick our plate out and they fill it with gruel and we move on. But if you're like, oh, this looks good today. Thank you for serving me. Oh, they appreciate that and they recognize you. And the next day in line, maybe you get just a little bit more than the next guy. So you learn 
where your bread is buttered. But anyway, these aren't secretaries in that sense. These are advisors. So the job of a cabinet position is to give the president advice. Um, I always think that this maybe isn't fair, but I always think that with people who homeschool their children, how the heck do you know enough about everything to be able to do that? I'm a teacher, and I think, without being arrogant, I think I'm pretty good at teaching what I'm supposed to teach. But then I try to help my ninth grade son with his math. It might as well be written in Chinese. I'm no good with that. So there's no way I would be able to do justice to such a thing. I know there's computer programs that you can use and stuff like that that, that a lot of those people do. But maybe I can homeschool my kids through about second grade, but then we're done with colors and numbers, and I can teach you how to read a little bit. That's about the end. So, uh, yeah, i, I got to have advisors. Our middle school wouldn't function very well if all we had was uh, Mr. Macklin. Mr. Macklin's a great science teacher. Not sure if he can teach American history. He probably could. He'd have to teach himself first. Uh, he probably could teach some math. Not sure if he could teach English, but he could always rely on his wife, who was an English teacher. But uh, we got to rely on each other. So we also moved the capital to Washington, D.C., which is... The problem that they faced at this time, all the states wanted the capital within their state. But if we put the capital in Virginia, that seems like that gives Virginia an awful lot of power. So Maryland wasn't very happy. Let's put it in Virginia. Maryland's like, no, Pennsylvania's like, that's silly. Let's put it right in the middle. So they do put it right in the middle. Washington, D.C. was located right in the middle. To us today, it's not right in the middle. It's kind of annoying because it's a long ways away, and it's right in the middle of the East Coast. But George Washington is like, well, it would be kind of uh, rude to put it in a state and give that state more recognition. So what if we took a little bit of land away from Maryland and a little bit of land away from Virginia, and we just built the capital there? So Washington, D.C. is actually 10 square miles of city. It will never grow. Now, if you've ever been there, it's a much bigger city than that. But Washington, D.C. itself is just 10 square miles. And then everything else surrounds it. Sort of like Omaha has Millard and, and Gretna and Papillion and Bellevue and Elkhorn and Bennington all surrounding it. But Omaha is just Omaha. Then it kind of swallows up everything else. That's what Washington, D.C. is like. Uh, but G-Dub helps create Washington, D.C. He helps design the city. He kind of builds it in a crummy spot, but anyway. Uh, and then he limits himself to two four-year terms. After eight years, the country was like, George Washington, we still need you. You're the best. And George is like, I'm old and I'm tired and I just want to retire. I want to go home and relax. I've been fighting wars, the French and Indian War and the American Revolution. Then you made me work on the Constitutional Convention. Then you elected me president, and I've served my time. I want to relax back at the plantation with my beautiful wife, Martha, and just enjoy the rest of my years. Unfortunately for George, there aren't a whole lot of them left. But that's fair. There was nothing in the Constitution that said he could only serve two terms. But because of the precedent that he set every man along the wall up here, all the way up until Franklin Roosevelt, right there, uh, served two terms or one. But some are one-termers, like President Trump was a one-termer because he wasn't reelected. So they said if two terms was good enough for George Washington, two terms is good enough for me. Then Franklin Roosevelt, it's a little bit different situation because he's president coming out of a Great Depression, like the worst depression in American history and in the middle of World War II. So I think most Americans thought it would be a bad idea to change presidents in the middle of two major catastrophes. And Franklin Roosevelt seemed to be kind of running things smoothly, at least by the standards of most Americans. Unfortunately for him, he died before he could serve his fourth term. He had a cerebral hemorrhage, which would be like a blood clot in the brain or a stroke. So uh, he was replaced by Harry Truman, his vice president. After that, then, <coughs> we did amend the Constitution to say two four-year terms. Two terms or ten years. 
So the only way you can serve 10 years, let's say um, in another month and a half, President Biden some, for some reason passed away and Kamala Harris took over, Kamala Harris would serve his last two years, then she could get elected, and then she could get reelected. Theoretically, that's how a 10-year term can take place. And the president says, once a year, I need to give, at least once a year, a State of the Union address. And this is still a thing today, so at least once a year, sometimes more often, the president will go in front of a joint session of Congress, so the president will be standing at the front, and in front of him are all of the House of Representatives and the Senate and most of the Supreme Court. They do take a handful of those people away and put them somewhere undisclosed just in case some terrorist crashed a plane into the Capitol at that moment and killed them all. Some of them aren't there, but most are. And at that point, he goes, this year has been a great year for America, blah, blah, blah. And we've done this. And in the future, we're going to do this. It's just to tell Americans, how are things going? But we're going to back up for a minute. I'm going to play this clip. It is from that movie, John Adams or Adams. Uh, and this is George Washington getting sworn in. Notice his mannerisms that might be kind of part of the reason why he's likable. He's kind of quiet. Notice his mouth is kind of awkward. So you can tell he's not very comfortable. Uh, and then notice there's a precedent that's set that isn't part of the plan. See if you can catch that precedent that still exists today. Everything. 